Name, branch of service, and the dates? Yep. So, uh, first name's Nathan, and then Hayden. When I was in the Army National Guard, I still am. So. Still in the present day. Right. Yep. We are in the conference room in Wilcom Hall. It is December 3rd. It's about 3 p.m. My name is Allison K. Yeah. Now I'm beginning to interview. Um, when where were you born? I was born in Sharon, Connecticut, March 29, 1985. Nice. And what was your pre-war, I guess it would be pre-conflict education? Oh, uh, high school diploma. Just high school diploma before that, and um, now you're going to uh, you're at SUNY now. Yes, sir. Yep. Okay. All right. And uh, did you work before you went into the service? I did. I worked at Ace Hardware Retail Support Center in Saratoga. Yes. And are you working again now afterwards, or just doing school? Just going to school. Just going to school now. Okay. Now, what? When did you enter the service? Twenty August two thousand two. Okay. Was it something you always wanted to do? Um, I think so. I did a, my last year in high school, like right before um, my last year started, and then, uh, yeah, I just kind of did it looking for something to do, I guess. To something before college? Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. And you you're obviously enlisted, right? Yes. Okay. Um, and you said it was the National Guard? Yes. Was there a reason you picked the National Guard? It was that? something that I could do while I was still in high school, mm -hmm. so that's kind of why I picked that. Um, like, I could have joined active duty. But I, the National Guard, they set you right up. Like, they start you right when you enlist. Well, back then they did, now they don't. But, so I could actually go out to a range and shoot things. And so it was, it was an immediate thing? You could right. get right into the action pretty much? Yep. yep. Did, they, did they work with your school? Did they want to work with, like, you going to college and doing National Guard? They, is it more of a just dive into that and deal with school after? Well, I was still going to high school. Oh, uh, sorry. So, um... I mean, they're, they, they have a whole office that sets you up with college and stuff, so. Mm -hmm. Where did you uh, receive your basic training? I went to, I went to Fort Funding, Georgia for like 15 weeks or so. 15 weeks. Um, tell us, can you tell us about like the experiences there, like what type of things happened basic. with basic? Yeah. Um, basic was definitely, a lot of people like, when I, before I went there, I heard so much about it, but I thought I had, like, I thought I would be awesome there. Like, I thought. Nobody could touch me. I was invincible, you know. And then you go there, and it's a whole they like you just get shot, and uh, you know you don't know anybody. It's a whole new environment. There's people screaming at you. Everybody's being screamed at, and uh, that was kind of. I look back at it, and it was like so much fun. Now that I can think of, like look back on it now, and uh, I I would love to go back just because it was fun, like looking at it now. But then, uh, like, while you're there, you're obviously scared, and not scared, but nervous or something, I don't know. Yeah. But uh, I had a good time there. I mean, it's, it's, it's fun, I guess. <laughs> did you um, did say, like, that the basic uh, training experience, with that, did that give you a lot of um, camaraderie ship that you get while you're in a military service? Would you say that helped you, like, bond to people that are going through the same thing? Right, I would say that you learn how to bond. I guess, because I haven't seen anybody that I went to basic training with since I got out of basic. So, mm -hmm. um, but you kind of learn, like, I guess, uh, how you would, how to bond with other people. You know, you, know, you learn how to build a team and work as part of the team. And, uh, Was it people from uh, all over the country? All over the country. All over the country. So you had to deal with, like, a lot of different yeah, types of people? Texas, yeah, so that was it. Is that interesting dealing with people that are from a lot of different backgrounds? Absolutely. It's kind of my first real, I got to, got to meet people from different parts of the country and see their point of view, so mm -hmm. people, so that was kind of fun. Get a little bit more into like the actual service. Um, what were the, you're still in it, what was the date that you began it again? Oh, uh, it was 20 August 2002. Okay, and what was, did you have any specific training that you were done, that you went through? Mm -hmm. Well, I went to base training, which was nine weeks, and then I went to infantry training, which was another six weeks. And uh, that all happened at Fort Benning, Georgia, just back to back. Yeah, yeah. And, um, what type, for the infantry training, what type, how is it different than the basic training? What do you learn there? It's more focused on weapons and tactics, like how, to, how a squad moves, mm -hmm. different like drills that a squad does, and um, just more focused to fighting. I mean, if I had picked like a camo, 
um, job or learning how to talk on a radio or learning how to deal with a radio during that time. But instead I learned how to like different weapon systems, learn more focused on that that aspect of training. Was it um was it your own choice to go into what you decided to go into? Like could you do I, I, different things? Yep. Actually I wanted to be a helicopter pilot first. And uh, so the path kind of would have been to be a mechanic first and then later on go to another school to become a pilot. And then uh, I didn't get talked out of it at all, but uh, I just kind of just kind of decided to, to do it, infantry starting out with. Um, I think I just kind of saw the guys that were there before me and they were, they were going to Fort Drum on the weekends and just blowing things up during the weekend. And being in high school in 12th grade, that, that sounds like fun. Yeah. Like, you know, who gets to do that? You want to blow some things up. Right. Nice. So, uh, yeah, like my first drill weekend, I, I was sh shooting at a school bus, this fake school, this old school bus that they had on top of the hill. I sat there for like maybe 10 minutes just shooting at it. So, yeah. and then going to school on Monday morning. Oh, wow. Being in high school, so it's weird. That's definitely, that's an interesting experience. How do you think I like um, matured you a little bit more? than your other classmates who weren't going through these things on the weekends? I would hope so. One of the first things that my first squad leader ever said to me was don't go postal when you go back to school. And uh, he was, you know, they were definitely looking out, you know, making sure that nothing bad was going to happen. Um, but I think, um, especially after Iraq, I was definitely at a higher level of maturity than some of my friends. Um, mm -hmm. But that, that's kind of later. And, uh, but I mean, after basic training, I was, I kind of, I don't think my maturity level was too much higher as opposed to when I got back from Iraq, how yeah, much higher it was. That's where it really happened. Um, right. What was your unit, did you have a unit or a ship assignment? Yeah, I was part of Charlie Company. Charlie Company. 2nd Battalion, 108th Infantry Regiment. It's in the New York National Guard. What was the last part you said? Um, Charlie Company, 2nd Battalion, 108th Infantry Regiment. How did you um, feel about combat before going into the war? What was your views on it? Well, really, like, Iraq wasn't even on anybody's minds in my unit. We thought we were going to go to Kosovo for a peacekeeping mission in mm -hmm. 2004. So that's really what we were training for, like how to search cars and just real peacekeeping type missions. And Iraq and Afghanistan were kind of going on in the background, but we didn't think we were ever going to have a part in that, in those missions. So at the time you entered, like you never think Iraq would turn into the conflict that it has turned into? Right, absolutely. So we didn't think we were going to have a part in that either. Oh. And, uh, and we were really just kind of focusing on like being deployed for a peacekeeping mission. That was the big, big, big training, how we were being trained. And uh, so really, I mean, being 18, 17, I didn't really think too much about what combat would be like, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, there really wasn't anybody older than me that had been in combat before, so you didn't really get that experience from them either. Okay. Um, see, while you were out uh, there, did you get any, like, uh, medals, citations? Did you receive anything of that sort? Or uh, nothing special, I guess, towards me. But uh, I mean, I got the Combat Instruments badge. What is that exactly? It's um, it just it's a badge that we wear above our name or above our tape here, and it's basically just a rifle with a big wreath around it, mm -hmm. and it just symbolizes that uh, that you're an infantryman, you've worn an infantryman slot, and that you shot it and received fire. So, I guess kind of before I go into Iraq, I if I saw somebody with that, they were like God, like. Nobody had that, and, mm -hmm. and uh, even people that trained me down at Fort Benning didn't even have that. So it was like if somebody had that, they were like, they had been in combat before, and you kind of looked at them a lot differently. So, so. What, was it a big deal for you when you did receive it? Did you feel yeah. more accomplished in your military life? Not really, because mm -hmm. you got it as a group of like 30 people, so I, you, you didn't, you kind of looked around and everybody else had it, it didn't mean anything. So, so. Once you had it, it had a little bit less prestige too? Right. Yeah. right. Um, when you were over, were you right in Iraq when you were there? Yep. How, um, how did you keep in touch with uh, the people at home? Okay. Well, my brother was actually there with me. Oh, that was another question I had because he had him there. So. Yep. And uh, 
so my parents had three sons, and two of us were there together. And uh, he had actually gone there a couple months before I did. And uh, so he was kind of like right there all the time. For he he had gone to Creek for a month and went to Baghdad for a month. And uh, but most of the time he was right there. But it really wasn't too. I don't remember it being very hard to communicate back home with like my parents. Um, that wasn't really hard. But at the same time, I was 18, like just left home, just kind of experiencing this whole thing, mm -hmm. being alone. And I think I kind of kind of enjoyed it a little bit, you know, just not having to, I guess, be around my parents or anything. So. Do you think though, the experience would have been more, like, more intense or different for you if uh, your brother hadn't been there with you? Yeah, it probably would have been. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's hard to say, I guess. But how, I think it been. how often were you guys able to like make phone calls home or write your letters? Was Pretty it? much as much as we wanted. The only time, you know, we couldn't is if we were out on a mission, or if we, um, or if there had been a casualty. What they do is they shut down the phone lines and the computers until they can tell that soldier's next of kin what had happened. So that, like for instance, if one of my friends was was hurt. The army at that small patrol base, they shut down the computers and the phones so that they can, so the army can go tell his parents or his wife or girlfriend what had happened first before she or whatever gets word from another soldier. It's more of an official way of doing it, I guess. But the blackouts would only be for like a few hours to maybe a day or two. Okay, so it didn't last very long? No. It did happen? Did you, do you agree with that way of? Yes. Shutting it down? Yes. Yeah. Okay. See, what was the food like? How was the food while you were over there? Um, at the bigger basis, which I wasn't at, I was only at the bigger basis for like, as I was coming into Iraq or leaving, and that was like for maybe two or three days. But the food there was great. But at our smaller patrol bases, it was, I guess, okay. Did you guys get the MREs when you were Yep, I actually got so sick of them already, so I stopped bringing them, and I just brought pop tarts and uh, slim jims out with me, <laughs> and uh, eventually I got sick from that, and then, so that turned out to be fun yeah. too. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we had MREs, and uh, I guess food was good. I mean, we had it, so it's kind of good. Yeah, it's always a plus to have yeah. the food at least. Yeah. How were, um, I read in this thing you said you guys had some really good supplies, yep. other than the um, the transportation. Was that what it yep. was? Yep. Yep. What were those, the transportation, how was that? Well, it was kind of in that whole, this was like the second year of the Iraq war, and uh, this whole up-armored Humvee, the, they, they didn't have enough up-armored Humvees for everybody, and it just seemed like our unit just didn't have any of them. I think we had three mm -hmm. at one point, and uh, they had, you know, we were supposed to have 12, and we were supposed to get 10 later on or something, and we just didn't have them. So we usually, and you know, few months before I'd gotten there, pretty much why I was sent was as a replacement. And who I was replacing was part of a five soldiers that got hurt because they were riding around in a five-ton truck without any armor, mm -hmm. or very minimal armor. And uh, it created, created a big controversy over this of armored Humvees. And uh, so, I don't know, like these five-ton trucks, they were from 19, they were from the 1950s. and. Uh, and uh, I think they were actually very, very good on the highways, but inside the city that we were stationed by, um, they weren't good at all yeah. because they could be shot down inside. But the armor, the amount of metal that it had protecting its bottom was very good. So out on the highway, it's good. Inside the city, it's not good. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, do you think it's the transportation's probably changed since you've left? Oh, More definitely. More intense accomplish that? Yes. Yeah. Um, so what would you say was probably one of your most memorable experiences in the conflict? That I would remember the most? I guess uh, October 1st, 2004. Um, at the time, it was the biggest um, offensive operation since the invasion. And it happened in Samara, that's where I was at. And uh, it involved like 5,000 troops, Iraqi and United States troops. And uh, my unit was right at the tip. And uh, and uh, my platoon was right in the front, and uh, it was definitely like, kind of like where I really first saw combat, where I heard my CIB. But it was just kind of like this big, big, big operation going on, and 
you know, just being at the front, seeing all the work that we had put into it the months prior. Um, I really think that was the biggest, the more like memory that I'm going to have yeah. for my rep was that yeah. day and the next few days. So, so um, what what type of feelings were going through you at the first experience with combat that you had? Was it mostly fear? Or was it excitement? Oh, it was, it was fear, definitely fear. fear. Um, I can only compare it to playing with having a PlayStation controller in your hand and just wanting to press that pause button just to stop everything around you. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how I like felt during it. Like I just want to press the pause button and just get out of there because I, I just hated that. And once you overcome that fact that you can't get out of it, you just got to go through with it, then it's a lot better. Did um, the people you listed, your brother and um, see your mentor, um, like Casper. Yeah. did they have a lot of um, influence on when you first got into the combat of you getting oh. over hitting the pause button and just getting done what you had to. Definitely. Uh, Caster, I mean, just, and, and all the other guys from my platoon, you could just look around and see that, you know, they were calm and they were good. So you, I wouldn't say that, like, my outside emotions were showing at all, but I'm sure everybody inside was definitely scared just as much as I was. But just because you can look around and see everybody else is calm, then you're kind of, you're going to be calm too. So I think that helped a lot. You know, I think if somebody freaked out, then, more people can freak out too. So. Yeah. Oh, okay. One question I really wanted to ask: the unusual um, service or duties. You said yep. you had the burned feces. Was um, I, I've seen it actually in like a couple of popular movies and stuff. It's seen as like punishment, or whatever, to go burn them. Was, okay. was it more of a punishment no. thing? No. No. It just had had to be done. So, uh, I was the lowest ranking guy in my platoon, and uh, the youngest too. And uh, that just happened to be my, my duty to do. I mean, I did it just about every day um, for like a whole month. It wasn't punishment or anything like that. Um, I think usually around 3 o'clock I did it. And uh, yeah, and it's funny, I get a lot, of, a lot of soldiers that also went to Iraq that may have been in Baghdad or something. When, I hear, when they hear that I had burned feces, they uh they have like a whole new respect for me and uh it's pretty funny. But uh it's got me a lot of beers too. <laughs> yeah. like, burn, burn Goodbye yeah. story. <laughs> and uh but yeah, it was definitely a different thing to do. I didn't ever think before I was gonna burn right that I was gonna burn burn crap. But yeah, yeah. yeah. So and a few times, you know, like the highest ranking guy would do it. He did it a couple times too. Yeah. So. Um, what did you mean, one of the responses to your survey, you said that there was a large amount of um, spirit to corpse? Esprit de corps? Yeah, is that, I'm not familiar with the term. Esprit de corps is like how well your unit is, like how, um, how well they get together and how well they kind of fight together. And uh, the higher the esprit de corps, the better. The lower, like, that's a, if you have a unit with lower esprit de corps, like, that's not good. It's a unit that can't work together, they can't achieve anything. But our unit, because it's National Guard unit, we were all from the same small area, the same area in the state. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, there's guys that played baseball with each other when they were five. So they we got along really, really good together. And uh, because of that, we were able to put that, you know, of, that feelings of not knowing. We knew each other, so I think we would do more for each other because we knew each other from the before. And. Uh, um, I just think we fought a lot better that way, and uh, just absolutely got, got along so much better, and it made being in Iraq so much easier because mm -hmm. we knew each other from before. So you do think it was easier knowing the people before, like being in combat with them, possibly seeing them get hurt. It's easier than like maybe being there with a bunch of strangers and seeing a stranger get hurt. Absolutely, I think. Um, uh, I don't think I'd ever want to go to Iraq with anybody else mm -hmm. um, than, than the group of guys that I went there with. I guess, yeah. Okay. And uh, one part of your, you said that uh, you guys, it seemed like you guys were um, superior in your training, but the simple techniques that uh, your enemies were using were still effective. Would right. You, would you say it was because of the poor equipment that you were using, or just pure homeland advantage? Or? Um, 
think I was kind of thinking more of a, a broader sense, but I think you're right on the home. They have the home turf advantage there. Um, I'm trying to remember certain ways that they. It, they just always seem to be, you know, like either one step ahead of us or they were like right behind us or something. Some something just didn't seem right, and we couldn't. It was kind of hard having all this good technology and not and still suffering casualties and wondering like how and why. Um, like the AK-47, like it's a great rifle, and we had so much. Or it's a very old rifle, and our rifles were so much better. But you know they were still able to to shoot at us and effectively. So it's like I don't know. It's um, okay. The mosques. We don't ever want to use bombs by mosques. Like so, we can't call in airstrikes against the mosques. So a very simple thing that they could do is just use the mosques to fight from or to keep their weapons in. So it's hard to. You know, defeat them if they're using such a simple thing as just staying in the mosque because they know we can't, that we're not going to bomb the mosques. Did you see them using like children, for example, at all, using those, as, using children to, you know, throw bombs or no. do something? You never saw anything like that? No, it was definitely a fear though. It was definitely a fear that <laughs> yeah. you'd have to. What do you think you would have done if you had seen a, a child attacking you? Um, just have to. Um, one of the, I don't, bad fears I had was that a kid would have a bag and he'd have a bomb inside the bag and he would drop the bag by us or something. That was always a big fear that I think we had because we always let kids kind of, you know, mingle around us because we figured if they, uh, the parents would be watching over the kids, but we figured the parents were watching out for the kids and if they knew bad guys were around, they'd bring their kids inside. So we figured if the kids were around us, we'd probably be okay. And, uh, you know, the kids were there are good for, they're always great to like hand out candy and stuff to take it to. So. Do you, do you think you're luckier being there earlier in the conflict rather than like in the last year or two where it's just gotten really ugly on both sides of it? Well, There's I, less support for the troops over okay, there? Seriously. Um, yeah, I, I really don't know. Um, it, seems, it seems like I definitely, like the worst times are definitely in 2006 and 2007. It kind of seems like things may be getting better. I hope anyway. Um, yeah, I mean, when I was there, I've learned, I went to a course over the last summer where they're explaining how, how these IEDs are becoming more c complicated and harder to, to uh, defeat and uh, learning about things that were just like crazy that I never had to deal with there. Like uh, the explosive shape charge was coming out when we were there, like when we were leaving. And then there's things like motion activated IEDs and just all sorts of crazy things that I never had to deal with. So I was definitely happy about that. Um, but, you know, I, I made it back from, two, from 2004, so. And you said, it says you, should, you did sustain an injury, right? It was a very, very minor burn. Yeah. Well, what happened? Do you want to explain what happened? Yep. That um, I was actually in the back of a five-ton truck that I explained before. And uh, we were actually, we had been doing this raid a series of uh, searches throughout the whole day. It was 10 hours probably. And uh, just extremely tired. And uh, our trucks were parked along a farm road. And uh, on one side of the road is c c Canal, and then the other side is the small village that we were searching. And uh, they were parked there all day. And uh, we finally got back inside those trucks. And all the truck did really was just go down about 100 meters, turn around, come back. And at some point, there was an ID there. And it was it hadn't been there all night, and they must have put there the day before. And that IED exploded, and uh, we all put our heads down. And the uh, there's enough armor in front of us to stop any shrapnel, but shrapnel kind of created all these sparks that showered down on our backs. So like when we put our heads down, it created the space in between the uh, the plate and our backs, and uh, and our skin. And so all this sparks went down in between our plates. We put our heads back up. That's when the plate and the skin came back together, mm -hmm. and that really burned really bad. <laughs> that sounds really bad. <laughs> and uh, the dog tags is what, um, like, really, really hurt the most. But um, right after that, we just dumped water down our backs, and it was pretty fine. Would you, would you say that um, maybe instilled more fear in you, or put more? Just like, made me more mad. Made you more mad and wanted you to go out <laughs> and fight a fight a little bit harder. Yeah. 
Um, was there anyone that you were, if you don't mind me asking, you don't feel comfortable answering, you don't have to. Um, anyone that you were with in your, uh, in your unit that like got seriously injured or any casualties? Um, well, not in my platoon, but um, in the other platoon, the second platoon, I was in third platoon. Um, the second platoon, they had, they had 12 or so casualties, so it just, um, actually the day before they ID on me that time, um, was the ID on this other guy um, that you know sent him home with a huge with part of his skull missing? So like, there's definitely casualties all around, and there you know we reacted to him, um, tried to anyway, I guess. And, but it seemed like every month two or three guys were getting hurt. So. Yeah. Um, let's see. So what was it like when you were you found out you were gonna go home? Oh, you, you had a that certain date when you knew you were going to go back? I don't remember. I don't think we ever had this certain date. Um, it was actually funny. Christmas Eve, they they told us to, you know, stand by, you know, be prepared to leave. And because uh, we, we were at a small little patrol base, we, it wasn't like we'd just jump on a plane and leave. Um, they had to come pick us up, 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 up in helicopters. And uh, so we're waiting to find out if we're going to leave that night. And uh, nobody wants to get their hopes up, obviously, to leave. And uh, we were at a talent show, and apparently the helicopters came and left without us. <laughs> so it wasn't for like another two or three days that we actually got on the helicopters and left. So, but uh, you know, like I remember being at small patrol base and being thinking to myself, "Well, don't get your hopes up. You know, it's still a helicopter ride. You know, something could happen on the helicopter ride. You know, and uh, still a certain amount of fear. Right. And, Everybody always kind of jokes around about, well, well what's going to happen is we're going to get to Kuwait and something's going to happen and we're going to have to go back to Iraq. So we're going to get extended. And, uh, but I remember that plane leaving from Kuwait and just everybody started clapping. And then, yeah, and like eight hours later or 18 hours later, we were back at Fort Drum. So, yeah, it was weird. <laughs> um. Do you think your your experience in Iraq or your experience with the um, National Guard in general, like, did it influence you at all about the election that just happened or, like, your ideals on, like, po like uh, politics in general? No. Um, in 2004, I voted, actually, when I was in Iraq, and uh, it's hard to get all the information. But um, just kind of looking back then, it was John Kerry and George Bush. Mm -hmm. And uh, looking at Kerry's record, like made everybody just want to vote for Bush because it seemed like Bush just supported the military more. And being in Iraq, you kind of wanted that support behind you. So, uh, but I wouldn't say it really, I don't think it really influenced my decision at all in 2004. I think I kind of realized that either one would probably do okay. Mm -hmm. so. And um, in this past election with McCain and uh, Obama, did you, their policies on pulling out in Iraq or getting the troops home as soon as possible, the policy differing once they had on that, did that influence you at all? Like, just thinking about you had been in that position, what people um, there now might be going through? I could see how they might be. Um, and I really don't know. Um, I, I really never believed in the idea of, like, having a slated time when to pull out. And I think kind of Obama's policy is that 16 months. And uh, I just kind of think it's got to be, I would hate to see all the hard work that's been done wasted. I guess, mm -hmm. you know, people have died. They, I wouldn't say they, you know, they did it for the people of Iraq or anything, but it would be just such a big waste, I think, if you come this far already, just to pull out without it working out for, for everybody. But, no, I mean, I don't really, I don't really know what else to say about it. Mm -hmm. When you uh, when you came home, did you have any regrets about anything that had happened back there? Or did you regret going at all? No, absolutely not. Um, I think within two weeks I started college, and that was a whole other experience. But I really don't think I had any regrets at all. I knew I still wanted to be in the army. I still wanted to to uh, I guess stay in the army and try to become something more than just a private. You know, me too. What was the first thing you did when you got off the plane, got out of Fort Drummer, and you're back in your, in your own home? First thing I did. Well, I remember getting really drunk <laughs> at the hotel, and uh, that was fun. And then uh, 
just got home, I think within a week, a week or two weeks, I was, I was starting school. And uh, so I think that was really the first thing that I really, really did was start, start college. Was it important for you to get right back to like a normal life? And did you, did anyone like try to make you, like treat you a little bit differently than they may have unless you, if you hadn't have gone over there? Right, uh, one of my old managers at the place I worked at went right, right back there within like three weeks or so. And uh, they just treated me great. They were like, hey, if you want to go home, because there's a warehouse and boxes fall and there's a lot of noises all the time, a lot of bangs. And uh, that first like night, I was on the edge and, and uh, you know, like something would drop or a lot of noise would happen and I'd get startled by it. And, uh, you know, I was allowed to go home a couple of those times just because like, it was definitely stressful. Mm -hmm. trying to readjust. Was it just the first couple of uh, weeks after being home, or does it still affect you now? Is tearing loud bangs, or is it, is it um, still with you? I know some of my friends deal with it a lot more, but I've kind of just put it through my head enough times that I'm home, I'm, I'm safe, you know. There's not, you know, nothing bad's going to happen, hopefully. So. But no, I don't, I don't think I'm bothered as much as other people are. So. Do you? Uh, you attended any reunions or seen people that you were over in Iraq with and hung out with them since yep. you guys have been back? Yeah, it's actually pretty sad because the only time we see each other is when somebody dies. So we're trying to change that whole uh, whole thing. It's we try to get together, we're trying to get together, but everybody's got something going on, you know. But it seems like the only time everybody can get together is when somebody dies and they have a few. So if uh, when you were when you're done with school and your uh, bachelor degrees, would you ever think about going back over in any type of conflict, go back into a combat zone ever again? Um, I don't think I would be as worried about it. Um, I'm training right now to be a platoon leader, mm -hmm. so I'll be in charge of 35 people. And uh, so I kind of got to be ready for it. And uh, I, I guess if it came up, I wouldn't have a problem with it. Question. How did uh, your military experience, how would you say it changed or influenced your life? How are you different now than you were before you even started your basic training? Um, well, I think I'm more mature. I've, when I see a goal, I'm more able to get it, I guess, or achieve it. And uh, I think older people kind of also look at me like I'm older than some of my peers, or I'm more mature than my peers, or more experienced. And, uh, so, I guess because of that, I've been able to do a little bit more. But I think it's, it's only changed for the good. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. Would you say you get um, more respect from people that had known you before, or even people that you just mentioned to that you went to Iraq? Do you, do you think it just gives you a certain amount of respect without Right. Knowing anything else about you? Yeah, definitely. And at the same time, I don't really like that either. I like to, um, because uh, there's a lot of people who go to Iraq, and uh, you know they're not all the best qualified people, I guess. And uh, and uh, just being judged on that fact, I don't really like that. I like, you know, if I was going to go to a job using my degree, I would want to be hired because my degree made me qualified for it, not because I've been to Iraq. So. In 2004. Mm -hmm. so. Is there anything else that you want to say that I didn't cover or you want to talk about? <laughs> I think we got it. Yep. Okay, great. Um,